Are you ready? All right, maybe not. Are you ready? All right, turn to your neighbor next to you. Just look at him. I got nothing else. Just look at him. Well, obviously today is Father's Day, and as part of talking about our stewardship series and understanding the responsibility and, and the, the involvement that is involved, the trust that has been given, we recognize that as fathers, there's a, an incredible place that is needed in our society for men of, of all generations to rise up and speak with a fathering voice. And when we talk about that, we kind of try to understand what would a father say? And, and maybe you can think from what are some things... Your dad, you know your dad, your father says. What, what's their saying, right? Dad always says this. Can you think of a couple of them, right? You know, cheating, Katie, you can't look at him right now and ask him, you know. <laughs> but let me ask you this. Maybe you have some favorite father sayings, but what are some things your dad would never say? What are some things your dad would never say? And see if you can find it in this video. Kids today, they really have it rough. I have no idea where we are or where we're going. I mean, when I was their age, life was easy, super easy. Why haven't you gotten a tattoo yet? How come you don't have any piercings yet? Yep, we're lost. We are completely lost. Ooh, sports. It, it, just do whatever the mechanic says to do. Vehicle maintenance is completely overrated. Look, whatever the mechanic is asking, just pay him. Pay him whatever he wants. I wish they had soap operas at night. I like that boy. You should date him. You should date him immediately. But what about the creepy guy with the motorcycle? He's cute. Yeah, sure. Spring break in Tahiti sounds fun. Hey, make sure you get all your video games done before you start your homework. You don't have to pass all your classes. What? You have a project due tomorrow and you've known about it for four weeks and you haven't started yet? Sweet! Doesn't anybody want to know if we're there yet? Remember, if you need anything between midnight and 4 a.m., please come wake me up. Hey, I'm on the phone. Could you bring the baby over and let him climb all over me? Hey, hey, can you please turn that music up? Well, we just stopped for lunch 10 minutes ago, but yeah, let's stop again. I never have trouble with my toddler. I never have trouble with my teenagers. I never have trouble with my adult children. You know, she's right. We are ruining her life. Yes, more homework to correct. All right, whining. Yay, tantrums. Hmm, vomit. We just really need to spoil these kids more. Sorry, buddy. I don't know any good jokes at all. You're 16. You pretty much know everything now. I think 18's a great age to get married. Okay, remember, make sure you turn on all the lights before you leave the house. Hey, did you leave the front door open for a couple hours? Thanks. <laughs> Those sound a little familiar. <laughs> Maybe you heard the complete opposite, right? Maybe even as you heard that, you were saying, oh, I, could exa I can hear my dad saying that, but the opposite, right? You know, sure, go ahead. You can step as late as you want or wake me up between four or midnight and 4 a.m. I love that the best, right? Yeah, or my favorite was, yes, we are lost, Right, because everybody knows there is no respectable man in the room who ever gets lost. Amen? All right. <laughs> we know, we know, we, we laugh and we joke and we poke fun at dads, right? And if there's probably something that's just, I have to say, I just got to get off myself, something that drives me nuts in our current culture is the way we portray dads now. I mean, as a dad, it's insulting to be known that I'm, that I'm dumb, that I don't know anything current, that I, I'm out of touch with everything, and I have to turn to my kids and my wife to tell me how to put my pants on, right? If you, anybody watch TV recently or, you know, I mean, in the movies, it's always like that. And I really think it's because maybe it's a little snapshot of what's happening in our culture that there's, there is a vacuum right now for men to rise up and take their place to be able to speak into a generation. 
We're missing men that would rise up. And I'm not just talking today, uh, and maybe I say this even a little bit ahead of myself, is this being a father isn't necessarily biological. Can you hear that? I'm not just talking to married men. I'm not just talking to men with children, but I'm talking to men today to encourage you to rise up. And you can speak into the generation. You can speak into the lives around you as a father would. And I want to go to a passage today and kind of unpack it a little bit today. An incredible, as I was reading this passage, and just caught up with this incredible understanding of the vacuum, the void that was there, and how someone stepped in to do the impossible. In Exodus chapter 2, we find this passage. In Exodus chapter 2, verses 16 through 22, allow me to read this. It says, Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to to water to their father's flocks. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. When they came home to their father, Reuel, he said, How is it that you have come home so soon today? They said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, then where is he? I got to just pause for a second. That's a father question right there, right? Well, where is he, right? Why have you left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah. They gave birth to a son and he called his name Gershom. For he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. Will you join me as we pray? Father God, I pray that you would just speak in this moment, Lord, as a father would speak to his children. Lord, help us to recognize, to celebrate, and also to stand in to that place as a father. Lord, I thank you so much for all you've done for us. We give you praise in your name. Amen. Now, you have to remember a little bit about this man named Moses, whose name means drawn out, because... Pharaoh had given a decree at the time of his birth that every Egyptian male should be slaughtered, should be killed. But the midwives of the Jews, the scripture says in the earlier passages, they feared the Lord. And so his mother, Jochebed, took his, told his sister to take him down to the river and put him in a basket in Nile. You're familiar with that story. okay? We know Moses' mom's name. Her name is Jochebed, or Jochebed, if you want to go that way. okay? And we know her, but what's Moses' father's name? We see a couple referenced to throughout the scripture. His name is Amram. He's the father of of Aaron and Moses. But that's really all we ever get out of him. Not to say, not to diminish Amram by any means, but just to knowing the situation for Moses. Moses was taken out of his family setting. He was placed in a setting that he was unfamiliar with. He was raised in a household that was not his own, that he struggled with his own value and his own identity to the point that he was trying to figure out his history. He was trying to figure out a little bit about himself. And when he found out that he was a Jew and he saw another Jew being tortured, he stepped in and he slaughtered an Egyptian man. Are you with me? I'm just quickly catching you up on the story. And so Moses ran for his life and was found out in the desert. He's sitting by the well, probably dying of thirst, probably looking, hoping for somebody to come by with a bucket. And of course, here comes these girls from Midian. You know, the, and they got these flocks and the shepherds come and they scare away the flocks and, and, or, and they're picking on the girls, and so Moses recognizes he still has some concept of right and wrong, and he steps up and he speaks into this moment and says, get out of here, chases him off, you know, does a manly man thing, and waters the flock for the girls. Of course, the girls leave, and Rural, who's also known as Jethro, both are kind of cool names, you got to admit. <laughs> he asks the girls, where is it? Where is he? Why'd you leave him behind? Right? Is every good dad, you're looking for that right guy for your daughters, right? Come on, so we got really quiet at that one, right? Amen, Amen. thank you, thank you, all right. (laughs) And they bring him in, and it says this, that Moses was content to dwell with him. Moses was content to be in that moment. Understand once again that Moses beforehand didn't have much of a father figure in his life. He had Pharaoh... He was known as a prince of Egypt under Pharaoh, but he really wasn't going to have any chance to the throne. Pharaoh's, all, all his focus was on his own natural-born son. Y'all with me? That's how it works back then. Moses was there because of Pharaoh's daughter took a liking to him and, and was carried him kind of like a pet. Can I just put it out there like that for us today? 
And yet in this moment, when Jethro reaches out to him and says, come and eat my bread, he says, come and have fellowship with me, Jethro speaks in a moment that is both vulnerable and telling for Moses that he actually comes in and he finds a place where he can settle down and rest. And we know this relationship continues to grow and continues to develop. And I want to take you to a passage that really kind of begins to unpack Jethro's role in Moses' life and how we can see that impact our own lives as well. You see, later on, Moses will go out. He will see the fire of the burning bush. He will leave Zipporah and his children behind Gershom. He will leave Jethro behind. And he will go to pursue the call of God. And he will go to see the people of Israel delivered from the hand of Pharaoh. Are you with me? I'm covering a lot of chapters here, but I want you to understand. So he's in this moment. He goes and he would not have been able to be ready for the call of God if he didn't have a place with Jethro. If Jethro hadn't taken the step of bringing him in and letting him marry his own daughter, bringing him his own own family, that call would never have been developed. And yet Moses goes, and we see the story continue to fold in Exodus chapter 18. If you want to flip down a couple chapters here. In Exodus 18, several years have passed. Moses has grown more. Family has grown. He's gone. He's delivered the people of Israel. And he's made his way back. And it says this in Exodus 18. He says, Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, who we also known was Ruel, heard all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Now Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her home, along with her two sons. The name of the first one was Gershom, For he says, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. And the name of the other, Eleazar, for he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Can I pause just for a moment? When Moses begins his journey in the land with Jethro, with Ruah at that moment, when he begins, he names his firstborn child, Gershom, he names him Wanderer, someone without a home, a sojourner. A pilgrim. Because that's where Moses identified himself in that moment. And he spoke that even to his own son's life. Are you catching this? And yet we see something telling that in the time that Moses spends with Jethro, in the time that he develops this relationship with Zipporah, he has another son. And he names the second son here, Eleazar. Which means, once again, for, I ha- for God has been my help, my father. The God of my father. Remember his father? His biological father's name is Amram. Thank you, Terry. You're paying attention. I like you. <laughs> his, fa- his father's name was Amram. And yet he was, found his identity and his value in that moment. He recognized, even though he never would probably see Amram again. He does, we don't hear from Amram again. We don't know anything about him besides he's recorded in the genealogies. He recognizes his identity. He recognizes his place and his value because Jethro even steps in to bring a fostering into that moment. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? The second I find really amazing is this, is that Jethro hears all that Moses is doing because fathers pay attention to their children, right? He pays attention to their family. And not only does that, he takes care of Zipporah and the two boys and the rest of the flock and the herd while Moses goes to pursue the call of God. I don't want to just speak this today as fathers is something for us to live into is this, is that fathers support the calling of the next generation. Once again, fatherhood is not merely biological. We can speak into the generations. We can speak into those lives around us. We can speak into those that are even our own same age and say, look, God still has a plan. God still has a purpose. How can I see you accomplish what God has for you? How can I see you pursue all that God has in store for you? So you got to understand, God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for you. God rejoices in you. And our challenge is to find our identity in our Father. doesn't matter if you're male or female, young or old. Our Father has called you by name. And he has good things in store for you. In fact, we see this Matthew, in the book of Matthew. Jesus says this. He says, which of one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? I mean, he's really asking. Can I just pause for a moment? Because there's that part of the father, well, we're going to teach him a lesson, right? We're not talking about that kind of lesson, right? But when your kid's in need, how many dads would be there for their son? You know what that's like, right? If your son asks for bread, will you give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will you give him a snake or a serpent? If you then, who are evil, 
know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give you good things to those who ask him? Can I ask you for a moment, when you ask God for something, do you think he's going to give you a rock or a snake? Do you have that much of a connection? Do you have that much of a, real, a, a relationship with him? Do you trust him enough that he's going to take care of you? See, Moses trusted Ruel, Jethro, with his family. Are you catching this? Do you as a father, do you as a man of God, do you trust the character and nature of God well enough to entrust your family to him? Or are you unsure of how he will treat them? Maybe today you grew up in a situation where you didn't have the best father because we know earthly fathers fail, right? Here's a real reality to all the young folks in the room. Maybe you don't even understand that. As dads, we recognize we screw up, right? We recognize that we make mistakes. I had a list, to my own shame, I had a list about 16, 17 year old when I was going through that age where I knew everything. You all with me? And I made a list of all the things that I would do differently as a dad. I'm type A. I do that, okay? I made a list of when I get older, I saved it for a number and number of years. Even after becoming a Christian, I did this before I became a Christian, I, I took that list and I looked at it and I read through all the things that I would do differently. And God began to challenge me. He said, do you think you can forgive your dad for being human? Do you think you can, you can forgive your dad for all the things that he didn't do that you think he should have done that he really didn't have to do to begin with? Can you get past that? Didn't take me long to kind of wrestle with that until I had my own kids. Am I speaking truth? When I get to my own kids and I realize, oh, this is why dad did these things to me. I was a handful. I've gone back to my dad numerous times. Hey, man, no, not now, hon. Save that for later. I have gone back to my dad almost like every Father's Day. I'll probably do it again today. Is I'll go see my dad, and I say, Dad, I want to just thank you again for not killing me. <laughs> right? And I say that a little bit jokingly, but there's times my dad and I almost came to blows with each other. And I don't know what's restrained my dad except for God. Because I was a punk. Y'all with me? Don't amen. <laughs> but a father endures all that because he sees the calling. He sees the future. He sees the potential in his children. What would your father in heaven say about you today? See, a lot of people believe God sets them up for failure. A lot of people believe God says, I want you to do all these things. I want you to be holy. I want you to be just. I want you to be good. But I know you'll never be able to do that. I just want to see you fall on your face. People live their life of faith like that. Or do we see a God that says, you know what? I loved you. I created you. I fashioned. I formed you. I know your beginning and I know your end. And I'm going to be with you through every step of the journey. So ask whatever you want because I'm going to give you a good gift. Is that the father you see? I want to challenge you today. A father, he... He protects, he encourages, he strengthens the calling, but he also celebrates the victories in your life. Listen to what Jethro continues to do with Moses. He, not only does he, he take care of all the kids, not only does he do all this, if he brings them all with him, we see this in verse 8. He says, Then Moses told his father-in-law all the Lord had done to Pharaoh and, and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them in the way and how the Lord had delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel and that he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of the Pharaoh and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know the Lord is greater than all gods because in this affair they dealt arrogantly with the people. And Jethro, Moses' father, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. Can, I just, can we just pause for a moment and take away just the theological ramifications for this? I like to kind of unpack it and look at it from the perspective of the leader. Moses, as a human being, has just gone through a lot. 
Just as an individual. Let's just unpack that. Let's just take all the Christianese. And Moses has gone back to a group of people who didn't really recognize him to begin with. He went back to his own household that he left behind because he murdered somebody. I mean, you talk about history right there. He goes there and he says, let my people go. And, and Pharaoh's got to look at him the first time he says, let my people go. He goes, well, you've been living in my house this whole time. And there, you're going to choose them as your people? Are, are you following this? So Moses has to break some emotional ties. He has to break some relational ties in that moment. And he decides to continue to pursue God. He goes through this whole process of bringing Israel out through the whole the ten plagues and standing out in the river and calling out the gnats and all these other things and all the questions and all the answers. I mean, folks, that's emotionally exhausting. Right? Right? You don't believe me? Mom, 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 mom. How, how many hours a day can you hear that? Right? Dad, 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 I've changed my name, right? <laughs> he's, as a leader, he's in that place where he's constantly being bombarded by all the needs of all the people. He leads them out in this process. He gets to the point where he's at the Dead Sea. He's at the water right there. The water's there, right? They got nowhere else to go. They got cliffs on either side. Pharaoh's coming right behind him. They can see the cloud of the chariots coming up behind him. You're, you're with me, right? This is panic mode for dads, Right? You're sitting there going, what are we going to do now? Because you know everybody's going, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Moses, you brought us here. We're going to die here. We're going to die, Moses. Moses, what are we going to do? Because that's what they were saying, right? And so Moses has to stand there, and he has to hold up his staff and let a strong east wind blow and part the waters, right? But it's not until he steps out and it begins to happen, right? Then he brings them through, and then all the chariots get emptied behind him, and then they, they're trying to bring him to the mountain. Along the way, they're complaining that they're hungry, you just ate. I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm thirsty. Go to bed already. I'm thirsty. Right? That's what's happening in this moment. All along the way, Moses has a relationship with God. God's speaking and directing. But don't discount the fact that he still has to deal with all the people. He has to deal with his own identity. He has to deal with what God's doing in his own life as well. And he gets to this point, and there's one person that can speak a word of encouragement and strength to continue him on. Someone whose voice was there for him that, that continued to, to bring value and identity to him, and that's Jethro. Jethro, Jethro shows up. I mean, can you just see that? man? I can see that as a dad, and my dad sitting down with me and said, man, you really killed it today. You were awesome. Man, I know God's doing something in your life. Did you see that? Did you hear that? Oh, man, I know that God has a plan and purpose for your life. How many people would like your dad to sit down and do that to you right now? Oh, some of you are getting really quiet. But you know what? You know that, right? You know when your dad speaks, right? Moms, they come and they, they speak. They, they help us understand our inner identity. They help us understand that we are loved and valued and everything. But dads, when they speak, dads can speak. And they, hey, look, you know what? From an outside perspective, you got this. You can go forward. You can take the hill country. You can slay the giants. You can speak to the mountains and they're going to move. We need men of God who will speak in those moments. We need men of God that will rise up and celebrate the victory and not get caught up with selfish ambition and jealousy because some guy is doing better than us. Come on, am I speaking to men in the room or not? Or not? Okay. I, I want you to understand we need more of that today. We need that moment where we hear guys speak to guys, you can do this. You can still do it. And also celebrate what God is doing. You know, the applause of the crowds is one thing. Can, I'm going to just be open and real with you. I love you all dearly. You know that. I, I, I do. I, would pour myself out for you. And I love the fact that many after a Sunday message will come and say, Pastor, that was a great message. That really spoke to my neighbor. Thank you so much. <laughs> right? That was really good, you know? But for all the applause and accolades, my dad says, man, I'm really proud of you. Man, nothing else competes with that. Nothing else comes close to that. I want you to understand how your father in heaven speaks about you. Oh, there's that Aaron. Oh, man. <sighs> We're working overtime today, boys. <laughs> He's not like that at all. He's not like, oh, there's Marsha. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. <laughs> he says, there's my kid. 
there's my son. There's my daughter. I'm proud of them. I love them. They're awesome. I made them. You know that? <laughs> Can I tell you about them? Man, oh, oh. Some of you don't understand how much God rejoices over you. He's excited about you. He loves you. He's passionate about you. In fact, listen to this. This is in Zephaniah. How many people have read the book of Zephaniah recently? You should. Here you go. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. This describes God's character. And let me ask you, and that you think, is this what God is described as? It says this is your father. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Amen. Right? I told my family that there's only one thing I want to have for Father's Day today, right? Steak's awesome, and all, but I want to have a dance-off with my girls. <laughs> right? I just want to sit there in the room and just be goofy with my kids and, and have fun. I love that. Right? You think, Pastor, can we dance? Yes, we put our hands up. It's okay. All right. That's Pentecostal humor for you. All right. A couple things, though. God is with them. The Lord is in your midst. He's not on the outside looking in. He's with them. Jethro didn't just say, hey, Moses, that's a great job. You just keep going, boy. But he was there with them. Moses, I mean, sorry, Jethro brought the sacrifices. He says, son, we're going to do this right. And he says, I'm going to bring the sacrifices, and we're going to rejoice, and we're going to celebrate together what God's been doing in your life. God, our Father, he rejoices over a mighty one who will save. I wanted to, like, I didn't have time. I wanted to put that video clip of Dad Saves. If you ever watched it, and, uh, there's, like, a couple viral videos. There's Dad Saves of dads who have just, like, reactionary arms. They're at a ball game, and Dad sits there and just goes, Choo! and catches the ball before it smacks his kid in the head, you know. Or the dad that catches the kid that falls off the swing as it's going loop-de-loop. He just catches him with one arm and just keeps going while he's grilling. I don't know. He just... I mean, they're epic dad saves. You know, there's moments where dads just, dads know, we just like put that leg out. Coo, you know, you stop that thing from falling on the kid. You just, yep, I'm doing it. I'm good, right? He will save you. Our Father, you can trust him. He will save you. He rejoices over you. When's the last time you recognize God laughing? I mean, rejoice. When you think of the word rejoice, can I, I, I'm just I'm hitting this home today because we have this warped identity of God our Father is this staunch, sober God that's in heaven going, don't screw up. I paid a lot of money for you. I, I did a lot for you to be walking on this planet. I brought you in. I'll take you out. You better behave yourself, right? We think God looks at us that way. But that's not what the scriptures indicates. The scripture indicates that God is just laughing. He's rejoicing. When he calls out your name, when you call upon him, he's going, yes, that's my child. <coughs> Did you catch the fact here that he, 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 he dances, he, he sings loudly over you? I mean, that's, that you see that throughout the scripture. He sings over the songs of deliverance. I mean, it's an incredible moment. God is singing loudly over you. Right? He's not singing, you know, top CCM greatest hits. Right? What do you think his song over you is? What, do you, what would God sing over you? He's a mean one. <laughs> no. And I like to think God has some, some incredible power ballads from the 80s over my head going, dun, 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 dun. Any child of the 80s with me this morning? I mean, and they've got to be songs that he's rejoicing. He's singing, you know, that's my kid. I love him. He's going to take the country. He's going to slay the giants. Da -na 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 -na. <laughs> okay, that's just in my head. Sorry. <laughs> Come on. You got to know God has to rock out. He has all that hair. He... All right. <laughs> A father protects the calling. A father celebrates the victories. But he also equips for the future. Listen to what happens here. Jethro is coming to the scene. He's celebrated with Moses. He's brought the family in, and he's beginning to watch his son-in-law work. Right? It's bring your dad to work day, and he's watching him. And listen to what happens here. In Exodus 18, verses 13, it says, The next day Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, 
what is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? Can I just pause there for a moment? Don't get too far ahead. Don't go too religious on me. Don't go too Christianese, right? But if your parents, your father-in-law steps into your workplace and says, what are you, why are you doing it this way? You should be doing it this way instead. Anybody bristle with that? You're lying. <laughs> right? You know, you know, if you brought your friend, your parent to work day, and they come on, why are you doing it this way? You could be doing it so much better. Let's continue. And Moses said to his father-in-law, verse 15, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another, and I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, what you're doing is the best idea ever. <laughs> he says, what you're doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Now, I want you to pay a couple things. Once again, he speaks in this moment. Jethro has enough of a relationship with Moses that he can step into Moses' work environment. Come on, guys. You know what, that, what I'm talking about, right? He has enough of a relationship that he can speak in that environment and says, hey, what you're doing is not wrong. It's going to burn you out and everybody around you. Jethro wasn't concerned about the organization as he was concerned about his son-in-law. He says, it's not good for you to do this alone. And, and let's just be honest. If you're Moses in that moment, you've just been sitting on the throne. Okay. You've been sitting in the judgment seat all day long. Right? It's been a long day at work. You've heard nothing but petty arguments and negativity and meh, 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 meh. Right? Am I the only human in the room? I'm just curious if that would wear anybody else out. Right? And Jethro comes up to him at the end of the day and says, Son, what you're doing is not good. Really? You too? Come on. But Jethro isn't concerned, once again, about the organization. He's not concerned about his work performance. He's not concerned about his bottom line or what his net cash value is. Jethro is concerned about Moses. And he says to him, this is going to burn you out. And he says this, if you jump down a couple of verses, verse 23, it says this of chapter 18. He says, if you do this, God will direct you. And you will be able to endure. All the people also will go to their place in peace. He says, look, this is what you got to do. He lays out this plan. I, I'm older. I've been there. I've managed flocks, Moses. It may be a little bit different thing. But I tell you what. You point somebody over 50 and somebody over those 50s and somebody over the 50 of the 50s of the 50s. And they come to report you. And they only bring the big matters to you. That way, it's more efficient. Things work out. If you will do this, if you will just listen to your father-in-law's advice. Fathers are there because they can have an outside perspective that we don't often have. In this case, it's Jethro speaking in Moses' life. Sometimes it's a friend. Sometimes it's another man, another woman that can speak into our moment, speak into our life and say, you look, hey, you know what? I got an outside perspective. I can see exactly what's going on. And, and if I could just give you a little bit of advice. If you will do this, you will listen. So he says in verse 20, so Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he said. Wow. 35 years ago, I'm standing outside. It's stinking, freezing cold. Right? My, do my dad has one job for me. Hold the flashlight still. Right? We didn't have the luxury of an inside garage. All repairs on cars had to be done outside. Any sympathy? Anybody? Right? I'm sitting there and I'm holding the flashlight. <laughs> are we done yet? Are we done yet? Dad, are we done yet? Anybody been there? Yeah, come on. All right? And my dad just said, pay attention to what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing. I'm connecting this wire to this wire. This is the carburetor. This is the exhaust manifold. These are the spark plugs. This is how you change spark plugs. Hold the light still. 
and, you know, and he's going through, these are the belts, this is what needs to be done, this is how you fix it, right? A couple months go by, it's now summertime. Lawnmower breaks down. Dad says, come on out, we're going to fix the lawnmower. Really? I'm working on my tan? I'm watching a TV show right now, Dad. Come out there and help your dad. <sighs> Whatever. <sighs> All right, Dad. What are you doing? Yeah, I see the cable. Yeah, it goes swingy, swingy. Yeah, okay. All right. That's the pump. Yeah, pump it. I see it, Dad. Anybody? Anybody identify with a teenager? Anybody in the room? And once again, I'm so thankful my dad did not kill me. Right? He put up with so much. So a couple weeks ago, mowing my lawn. Bing! Something snaps off. Right? Guess what happens to the lawnmower? It's dead. And I'm sitting there thinking, if I just keep pulling on this cord hard enough, <laughs> it's going to start. Right? You just got, I got to, if I keep pumping this, I'm just thinking this whole time, right? I think, I, and I, you know, and I get to this point, he says, you know what? I can't, I, I'm just going to pay somebody to fix this. I'm tired of this, right? It's been hot. It was one of the warm days we had, okay? So <laughs> put it in the garage, and I set it there, and I did my little poopy face emoji on Facebook, and I said, bad day, lawnmower died. Guess I'm done mowing. Half the lawn was done mo- uh, unfinished, right? Anybody been there as a dad? I hate that. I hate having the lawn half done. I hate having my lawn where like one lane of grass did not get mowed. <laughs> Y'all with me? Sitting there, I left it. Sitting in my lawnmower, or my garage, lawnmower's in the garage. I'm sitting there, pouting, figuring out who I'm going to figure to come over and fix my lawnmower for me, or who I'm going to take it fixed, or maybe I just go buy a new one and throw this one away. My Uncle Larry, give a shout out to my Uncle Larry because he watches these videos. He gets on Facebook. He says, come on, your dad taught you better than that. <laughs> Uncle Larry. <laughs> so sure enough, I go out to the lawnmower. Okay, now what did dad do again? All right, take the air filter off. Take the manifold or the cover off. Oh, there it is. The spring broke. All right. We can fix the spring. Guess what? It works now. <laughs> right? So then I had to go put all happy face, smiley face, hearty emoji. Thanks to my dad who taught me how to work on small engines, you know. <laughs> He's probably laughing. Going, yeah, I'm sure you enjoyed those lessons a lot. <laughs> but my lawn would be like miles high now, right? Or my checkbook would be emptied, right? Right? There's, I, I'm sure you can think of those moments that your dad spoke into your life. Words of encouragement, direction. Maybe it doesn't have to be small engines. Maybe it's something else. But that's the value of dad has. That's the value of a father. A father can speak into the generation and not only support them in what they're trying to do, but equip them in where they're going. The tools that may not make sense now, they'll have a dividend later on. I find myself now asking those questions. Okay, now how did mom and dad, when we were buying our house the first time, how did mom and dad do the house thing? How did mom and dad deal with with ornery teenagers? No, don't use that example. Let's go with another one. How did mom and dad do this? How did dad handle this? What would dad do in this moment? I I have to give a shout out to my dad because I watched my dad over the years work at the factory. And all the times I would give him grief and all the things I would do, I remember the, the, how the other workers would come to me and say, oh, you're Mike Heimer's kid. And they would say, he's a good man. And they wouldn't give me any grief whatsoever. But I watched my dad day in and day out work at the factory and ha- lead a life of integrity. And he'd always give his best. And he'd always, even when he was hurting and his pain, even when he was like walking with half a leg, I mean, it was just an incredible story there too, but he would just continue to keep plowing through. And that equipped me because I looked at his life. When things got rough, when I felt like quitting last week. I'm just kidding. But I just need if you're paying attention. 
But when things get rough, I'm like, all right, dad stuck it out. I can stick it out. Are you equipping the next generation, men? And once again, a father isn't merely biological. A father is one that has a voice that speaks into a generation, modeling and showing them how to live. Jesus, Jesus set this up for us. In fact, listen to what Jesus' relationship with the father was like in John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, 19, 20, they, they're challenging Jesus, and Jesus says this. He says to them, truly, truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all that himself is doing. And greater works than these he will show him so that you may marvel. Wow. Can I go a little bit on the edge of a limb here? And can we just take your name and put it in here? Truly, truly, I say to you, Wade can do nothing of his own accord but only what he sees his Father in heaven doing. For whatever the Father in heaven does, Wade is going to do likewise. For the Father loves Wade and shows him all that he is doing. And greater works Wade will do so that we all may marvel. You're thinking, well, Pastor, that's pretty pompous of you to put your name in there. Put your name in instead. Are you, are you hearing me today? Can I, can I step on our toes here? I know it's getting late. I know it's getting hot, but just work with me just for a moment. Jesus was only doing what he saw the Father in heaven doing. Is it possible our generations are suffering because we have men who are no longer looking to the Father? We have men who are no longer modeling what they see the Father doing. They're acting on their own accord. Can I go a step further and just even throw this out there? What if Jethro... Never welcomed Moses. He's a Midianite. Jethro was in, or Moses was an Egyptian. The girls said as much. Jethro would be quite honestly, get that stinking Egyptian out of here. They're oppressive. They're taking over our land. They keep raising the tax on sheep and land. I can't handle them anymore. He could have done that. He didn't know who Moses was. He just knew that Moses was a guy that saved his daughters from shepherds and watered the flocks. Maybe he was just a good Samaritan that day. But Jethro took a chance and welcomed him in. Can I challenge us today? You don't realize, men, the value you have to this church and to this generation. But first, you've got to start looking to the Father. First, you've got to understand that the Father loves you. I think that's the thing that marvels me the most in Jesus' passage there in John chapter 5, verse 20, where he says, once again, for the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. Okay, I'm, going to get on your, I'm going to step on your toes really hard. I'm going to ask you to man up for a second, gentlemen. I'm going to challenge you right now. Can you say the same? Can you say this morning, my father loves me and delights in showing me new things. My father in heaven loves me. Women, can you say the same thing? I am my father's daughter. And he rejoices over me with loud singing. If not, it's time to kick out some lies. If not, it's time to change our perspectives just a little bit and, and remove the things that we've substituted and receive the truth that God would have. It doesn't matter really. I, mean, I know the pain. I know there's hurt there. It doesn't matter your home life growing up. It doesn't matter even what your home life is now. But you need to recognize what God is doing now. God looks at you with love. God looks at you with compassion. God looks at you and rejoices with you. God looks at you and he laughs with you. God looks at you and he dances with you. He rejoices with loud, obnoxious singing. Right? I don't know, maybe I have this picture of God. This is, I mean, 
You should meet him. I love him. He's pretty awesome. But my, my, my picture of God is this, is that God's going, right now, he's going, you tell him, you tell him, boy. You tell him, son. You tell him how much I love him. And I can see God up right now. He's just going, that's my boy. That's my boy. Right? You're thinking, oh, that's so arrogant. Is it really arrogant if it's true? I mean, some of us have been caught up with this lie, God doesn't love you, and I'm tired of that lie. I'm tired of the lie that the Father is just putting up with you. I'm tired of the lie that says that God really isn't looking to celebrate over you. God is trying to make things difficult for you. I'm tired of the lie that says that you're nothing, you have no value, you have no purpose, because it's not true at all, and you're playing with it for too long. It's time to get rid of it and recognize you are called, you are chosen, you are given a purpose. Every week I find my daughters, and they'll tell you, you can ask them. I'll find them, I'll hug them, I'll tell them this. You are loved, you are valued, you are beautiful. Yeah. Because I know as a father, the power of being able to speak that into their lives. I've long lived with the understanding that when a boy comes up with my daughter and says they're beautiful, they can say, I know, my dad already told me. And I'm okay with that. You know, when the enemy comes at you and says, Ugh, you're a mistake, you're unwanted, you're an accident, you can say, devil, get, shut your lying mouth. I'm loved. I'm valued. And I'm beautiful. Today, would you receive the Father's love for you? Tracy, if you'd come. I want to challenge you in a couple of things as we prepare our hearts to close and pray. It's simply this. First, on a personal level, I want you to know that you truly are loved, valued, and beautiful. That your father is passionate about you. You need to come to terms with that. And maybe in your own way, you need to do the, maybe you need to go stand in front of a mirror and you need to say it out loud with a voice loud enough for you to hear and say, I'm loved. Pastor, you're getting kind of loud. I'm Pentecostal. I can do that. Maybe you need to get up and you need to shout louder than the voices that have been shouting at you. Maybe you need to get up and shout louder than the voices that have been lying to you. I'm a child of the king. I'm chosen, I'm appointed, I'm called, and I'm named by him. I carry his last name. He has a plan, he has a purpose for me, and I'm not done yet. Maybe he's someone in this room, and maybe that's where I'm just hung on this right now. You need to hear this deep down in your heart. You need to hear this deep down in your spirit and your soul. You need to know this truth. Because you've been listening to the lies too long. Your father's passionate about you. Not long after I was ordained, if you, if, just a little bit of my story. I didn't grow up in church. I didn't go to church. And that's for me to come to Christ was a pivotal moment in my family's life. And for me to go into ministry was, a, was a, just a uh, rock the whole boat kind of moment for my family. The day of my ordination was one of those incredible days. Because my dad and my mom had came all the way out from Illinois to see me in Colorado for this incredible moment. I don't really remember everybody else. I know Andrea was there. <laughs> but I know my mom and dad was there. And I won't go into all the details, but I, we were at a moment where a relative was, was chastising me about wasting my life going into the ministry. Great time to do that. I still remember the moment my dad stood up and said, you shut up. My dad never says shut up. He, was, he says, he's being ordained today, and God's got a plan for him. I mean, I can tell you, I, I won't do, go into the, I can tell you exactly where we're at. I can tell you exactly the hotel room. I can tell you exactly that moment my dad stood up and defended me in front of all my relatives. And that day of ordination was an incredible day, not so much because I got a paper from the Assemblies of God, because my dad recognized the purpose and the calling in my life. I want you to understand 
fathers, you have an incredible role to your kids, first of all, to speak into their lives. But you also have the opportunity to speak into generations. We need Jethro's to rise up. We need those rules to rise up, those priests of Midians that speak into those children that are not their own children, but will receive them as their own. And speak life and hope and purpose and calling. Amen? Be willing to defend and be willing to say there is still a purpose and plan for you because, you know, we have a lot of broken men around here. In our culture, we have men that are looking for identity. They're looking for something and they're taking things in their own hand and Egyptian slave drivers are dying. But we need someone to stand up and say, you know what, I want to celebrate the victories with you. I want to celebrate what God's doing in you. I believe God's not done with you yet. We need men to speak into the women's life, into young ladies' life. So you're valued. Don't sell yourself cheap. Right? We need to be able to speak into generations. Says you're more value than any boy can give you right now. You just hold on to that. We need fathers to be willing to stand up and say, you know, you better be careful with her. Am I stepping on toes today? I hope so. I hope it challenges us just a little bit. Because our culture, our society, desperately needs to hear the Father's voice. Men who will rise up and speak as our Father would speak. So today, first of all, hear God's love and cry, His passion for you. But also, the challenge that you would rise up and do likewise to those around you. Pastor, you just forget to close your eyes. And I want to do something a little bit different. I know it's Father's Day. I know you probably have barbecues waiting on you. But can I have every male in the room, would you please stand to your feet right now? I'm calling you out in front of everybody else here. You're standing now because you have been chosen to speak out and to stand out. It's time to come out of the shadows. It's time to quit hiding behind false identities. It's time to step out into your true calling and purpose. You are loved. You are valuable. And you're beautiful. You are wonderfully created and made. And Father God, I pray for every man that is standing up in this room even now. I pray your blessing be upon them. I pray, God, you would strengthen them in their inner man. I pray that they would grow in the wisdom and the admonition of the Lord. I pray they may hear the Father's voice. I pray, God, that they may see you move in their lives, that they can hear you lead and guide and direct them, and that they would do likewise as they see you doing. Father, I pray that you'd give them staunch hearts, steadfast spirits, boldness to go forward without holding back. I pray today you would encourage them we have them stand up even now, not as a way of singling them out for destruction, but raising them up in recognition of purpose and calling. God, I pray your blessings be on them now in the name of Jesus. Bless them, Lord, we pray. And Lord, I pray you would speak through them. We love you, Lord. And Lord, I would pray for the remainder of the church today. I pray for all of us as a family today. I pray, oh God, that you would move powerfully in our midst, that we would know the incredible love that you have for us. And I pray now for you, church. I pray may the Lord bless you. I pray for the Lord to keep you. I pray that the Lord would make his face to be radiant upon you and watch over you. I pray that he would guard you as you would go out and bring you back in safely. And I pray that the joy of the Lord would be your strength both now and forevermore in the name of our God and our Father. May you now be blessed. In Christ's name we ask this. Amen. Happy Father's Day, men. God bless you.